Well, hi everyone. Uh, this is Lynn Thompson coming to you uh, on a recorded version from Chester, South Carolina this past Wednesday. And that is because I want to celebrate the career of one of my favorite authors, Jacqueline Suzanne, born on August 20th, 1918. She was the daughter of a portrait painter in Philadelphia. Her mother was a school teacher, and she was very attractive and had an IQ of 140. She decided to be an actress, despite the advice of a teacher who said Jackie should be a writer. She breaks all the rules, but it works. And when she did make that change, Jackie Suzanne changed the world of publishing forever. Joan and Jackie Collins and many others owe her their careers. You see, before then, publishing was a fairly highbrow operation. Uh, publishers were almost entirely in New York or Boston. They were made a good living. And most bookstores were in big department stores in big cities. So as I mentioned last week, after about 1922, literature split, or the notion of literature between high art literature and modern things like T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland or James Joyce's Ulysses, which came out that same year. And so by the early 1960s, publishing was ready for another change. The guys who were the radicals starting New York publishing houses back in the 20s were now old ready for retirement, and they weren't keeping up with the times. But Jackie was a decade before realizing that, and she realized it long before anybody else. She initially decided out of high school to be an actress. And from 1937 to 1946, she held lesser parts in 21 Broadway shows. She wrote two, one of which was produced but for reasons now unknown, only ran for 37 performances. In the 1950s, she glommed onto television, the new medium in town. She did commercials and variety shows and was a model, but she found herself typecast. She said, I got cast as what I looked like, a glamorous divorcee who gets stabbed or strangled. In 1955, she became the commercial face of the Shifley Lace and Embroidery Institute. Over the next six years, in addition to that, she wrote, produced, and starred in commercials, which aired in local TV in the New York market and on the Dumont network, which is now gone. Sometimes she was joined on the air by her poodle, Jacqueline. She energetically pr promoted whatever product she was hired to shill and made personal appearances on their behalf. But the chickens came home to roost in the early 1960s as one night she was leaving a New York restaurant and heard someone shout, there's the Shipley girl. Suzanne, realizing that 25 years of backbreaking work and Broadway shows eight performances a week had culminated only in recognition of her as the girl who did lace commercials. She got kind of discouraged, but being the way she was, relentlessly pulling herself up, she finally followed her teacher's advice and started writing, or as one critic said, typing. Suzanne was undeterred. I don't think any novelist should be concerned with literature, she said. Literature should be left to essayists. Her first book was a science fiction novel called Yargo, which sold rather poorly, but then enjoyed a boom after she died. Dolores, her last novel, was based on the life of Jackie Kennedy and was published after her death. But in the early 1960s, she got the idea of public writing a book about show business and drug use, which she initially titled The Pink Dolls. But in the meantime, after the Broadway producer Billy Rose encouraged her, she published a book in 1962 called Every Night, Josephine, 
which was about her beloved poodle. And she began to adapt into book form letters she had written about the dog. Published in late 1963, Every Night Josephine sold 35,000 copies in hardcover, and by 1973, a million and a half paperbacks. This affectionate account of Josephine's hijinks, and by all accounts, she was a character, uh, got positive reviews, hit the Time Magazine bestseller list, and act Josephine even became a prop in the promotion of the book about her, often occur appearing with Suzanne on a book tour in which she they both appeared in the same outfits. Even after publishing her other novels, Suzanne cited Josephine as her favorite of her own books. In 1966, Suzanne published a book that had been rejected by more publishers you can, than you could count, Valley of the Dolls. It spans 20 years after World War II in the lives of three young women, Anne Wells, a New England beauty, who liberates herself from her small staid town by coming to New York, where she falls in love with the dashing Lion Burke. Neely O'Hara, an ebullient vaudevillian who becomes a Hollywood star and self-destructs, and Jennifer North, a showgirl with little talent but a gorgeous face and figure. All three women fall prey to the dolls, amphetamines, and barbiturates, and that was the euphemism that Suzanne invented for them. The book came out in February of 1966 and took off like a Cape Canaveral space shot, one reporter wrote. The story was said to be, and probably was, based on real life characters like Judy Garland, Dean Martin, and the singer Ethel Merman. Although Publishers Weekly, in an advanced review, called the book powerful and sometimes fascinating, it, like all her work, got largely negative reviews. Gloria Steinem, the feminist, panned the book, as did the review in the New York Times. Time magazine called it the dirty book of the month and said it might be more accurately described as a highly effective sedative. Despite the poor reviews, the book was a commercial juggernaut. On May 8th, 1966, its ninth week on the list, it hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list, where it remained for 28 consecutive weeks. It had a total of 65 weeks on the list, becoming the best-selling novel of the year. By the time Suzanne died in 1974, it had entered the Guinness Book of World Records as the best-selling novel in publishing history, with some 17 million copies sold. And by 2016, the book's 50th anniversary, the sales number had reached 31 million copies. Part of what makes Jacqueline Suzanne noteworthy, and I think really there are two things. One is that Valley of the Dolls created a new genre of modern fiction. It was blunt, it was de detailed in things that had been scandalous before. One of her uh, models was Grace Metallius, the housewife who wrote Peyton Place, which at the time in the early 1960s was considered utterly disgusting by respectable people. Even the toned down movie was the subject of boycotts when I was a boy. Uh, so a lot of people who think of collecting books as collecting literature really stop their clocks at about 1945 or at the latest 1962 when Ernest Hemingway killed himself. After that, it's all just trash. And in a way, they are right about that, at least in terms of volume, because Jacqueline Suzanne also revolutionized the publishing and marketing of books. She is universally acknowledged to have been the first brand name novelist, a novelist who sells well, utterly independent of and ignoring of critical attention or approval. With her husband, Irving Mansfield, 
she revolutionized book promotion, and they are widely credited with creating the modern day book tour. Michael Corda, the editor of her second book, says that prior to Suzanne coming along, people weren't so much interested in selling books as they were in publishing them. To what had been a gentleman's profession, she brought a show business sensibility. When each book came out, she and Irving got in their Cadillac, loaded the trunk with copies, and hit the road. She toured extensively for each of her books, making appearances at bookstores all over America, no matter how small the town might be. She was on countless TV and radio shows. Her books were advertised on the entertainment pages of major newspapers, rather than given dull gray reviews in the major book review sections of the New York Times and the Boston Globe. Her husband tested her book covers to see how they appeared on TV, which was then in black and white and a bit grainy. She even served coffee and donuts to the truck drivers who were delivering her books. She lavished attention on booksellers, knowing in advance who they were, what their names were, who their families were, she sent them thank you notes and even bought copies of her own book for the clerks in the stores. A new book, she said, is like a brand of detergent. You have to let the public know about it. What's wrong with that? Critics were almost unkind to her books, and she didn't give two slaps about it, to quote Flannery O'Connor. The Love Machine is popcorn said a relatively gentle review by Christopher Lehman Haupt in the New York Times. It goes down quickly and easily. It is the kernel of an idea, the seed of an inspiration, exploded into bite-sized nothingness. The author, outspoken as well as ongoing, outgoing rather, had her own standards. A good writer, she said, is one who produces books that people read, who communicates. So if I'm selling millions, I'm good. Suzanne and her husband uh, tired, continued their touring for over a decade. And in one memorable exchange on the David Frost show, John Simon, the critic now forgotten, asked her, do you think you were writing art or are you writing trash to make a lot of money? Ms. Suzanne replied, little man, I am telling a story. Now, does that make you happy? In her lifetime, Jacqueline Suzanne's books earned $8 million for her in royalties, and more than a million remained after taxes and expenses. 60% were invested in tax-free bonds and the rest in stocks, all through two corporations she and Irving set up. In 1962, at the age of 44, Jacqueline Suzanne was just getting underway with her writing career and diagnosed with breast cancer. During her recuperation, she made a pact with God. If she were given 10 more years of life, she would prove herself to be the best-selling writer in the world. In the end, she was given 12, and she arguably succeeded. At her death, Valley of the Dolls was the best-selling novel in the world. It has never gone out of print. None of her other books have ever gone out of print over 50 years later. Nowadays, if you look around, you can find signed copies in good condition selling for $1,000 to $1,200. A more commonplace conditional uh, first editions you can get for as low as 10. She was a remarkable woman, and she demonstrates a point I like to make with uh, viewers about publishing, uh, collecting rather. Collect what you like. If other people say it's trashy, it may well prove to be. But a lot of the great names in book collecting have been people who went where the public's attention was not. They collected books that were out of favor. They picked up first editions on the cheap. And who knows? Uh, Jacqueline Suzanne may, in another 50 years, be wildly popular. In the meantime, you've got a collection of nice books that you like. Let Jacqueline Suzanne have the last word. From The Love Machine, 
A young man was asked, what about television? It's an octopus. It's no longer just a little box. It's the love machine. Why is a love machine, a reporter asked? Because it sells love. It creates love. Presidents are chosen by their appeal on that little box. It's turned politicians into movie stars and movie stars into politicians. It can get you engaged if you use a certain mouthwash. It claims you'll have women hanging on your coat tails if you use a certain hair cream. It tells kids to eat their cereal if they want to be like their baseball idol. But like all great lovers, the love machine is a fickle bastard. It has great magnetism, but it has no heart. In place of a heart beats a Nielsen rating. And when the Nielsen falters, the program dies. It's the pulse and heart of the 20th century, the love machine.